find our way back to our seat today. I am so glad to see your face in the place. Come on, can we give God some praise? I didn't even see you walk in. Oh my God, it's been since March. How are you? I'm so happy to see each and every one of you. It is going to be a good day in God's presence. Do you believe that? Are you ready for the word? so much for all your support all week long. You know that two weeks before we shut down, my beautiful bride got sick and she missed our last two Sundays before we shut down. And here we are again today on our reopening and she's gone today. And you know, if you know my bride, if you know my wife, you know her heart is here and she is uh, recovering today from surgery. Uh, last Sunday, let me, I'll just give you a brief update if you don't follow us on social media. Let me just say this as well. Thank you for your support and your overwhelming, just lavish of love. I was telling uh, people today, we have, on my phone right now, I have 286 six text messages from people just reaching out for Britannia. So thank you. I don't know how we're going to respond to everybody, but it's, it's been overwhelming. Um, seven days ago, last Sunday, she went into the ER with really just debilitating pain. She has an ovarian, she had, praise God, she had an ovarian cyst, and, which we've known about, but it had grown at a rate that was shocking and concerning to the doctors. It grew to the size of a 28 centimeter uh, large, extra large, I think is what the doctor said, watermelon inside of her belly. In fact, I'm going to show you a picture. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, so she had surgery on, on Friday and she, they removed it and the concern was that there was a section of the cyst that had that was cancerous. Praise God, it is not. This is nothing to drive you to your knees quicker and faster than when one of your loved ones is, is going through it, right? And so we pray. All week long, God, you gotta, you gotta come through. God, you gotta heal my body. God, you gotta, you gotta do, do. We'll take whatever miracle. To look. I don't care what the miracle looks like. We're gonna accept it. We're gonna receive it. If it's surgery, if it's healing, and whatever you name it, we're gonna take it. And so she had surgery Friday. She is recovering today, doing well. She is up and about, moving around. And I just, again, thank you for your overwhelming support. She sends her love. We were talking this morning. Sends her love. Uh, wishes to be here. She, this is how desperately she wants to be here. She was telling me this morning, I'm going I'm to be in church next Sunday. And I'm like, baby, I just don't really ever know if you're going to be in church next Sunday. But she loves you. She sends you her love and her greeting. If you text her or DM'd her or whatever, I'm sure she has seen it, right? And she's just overwhelmed and bombarded. So, so thank you. Can we just give God praise? <laughs> And God is the God. This, this is not the sermon. God is the God who answers prayer. Amen? And if you are facing something today, you have a need in your body, you have a need spiritually, you have a need that you are facing today, drop to your knees and ask the God of miracles to be the God of miracles in your situation. And he will come through 100% of the time. It will not look, I promise you, it will not look like how you think it's going to look, but it's going to be powerful and it's going to be a display of God's love in your life for all the world to see. This is the power of God on display. And we are giving God all the praise for what he's done in my bride's body, what he's going to continue to do. Amen? Amen. So one more time, let's give God. Listen, I, I haven't preached in four months either, live. So uh, you're going to have to, you're just going to have to be, I'm going to get loud today. We're in a bigger space. You're further away. All right, so I'm going to get loud. I'm going to shout. Here's what I need from you today. I need you to shout me back down, all right? We've got a fraction of our church here, right? We don't have everybody here. So I need you to help me out. I need you to shout back at me. You can say amen. You can say hallelujah. You can say mm, that's good. That's for me. You can say mm, hallelujah. That's for you. You can say whatever you want. All right? You've got to help me out. Let's practice. On the count of three, say whatever you want. One, two, three. Amen. All right. James chapter number four. Let's dive right in. We're in a collection of talk, in talks in the book of James. We're continuing. This is what we do. If you're new to our church, we pick a book of the Bible and then we talk our way through that book. We believe. The Word of God is 
inspired. We believe every syllable, every comma, every period. We be, even believe the maps in the back are inspired by God. We just believe the Word of God is good, good stuff, and it's, it's applicable for your life today. So James chapter number four, I've entitled today's talk, Married to God, but Dating the World. Married to God, but Dating, can you just say, ooh, it's going to be juicy today. Married to God, but Dating the World. I want to I wanna start with just a, a little hypothetical, rhetorical, sermonic survey, all right? I'm going to ask a question, and I would just, you probably should not answer just so I don't get any, anybody in trouble here today, but I'll, just, I'll use me as an example. Let's say for an example, I, I'm married, well, I am married, so we can say I am married. Let's say, here's my question, do you think it's okay for me, being a married man, committed, devoted to my beautiful, blonde hair, blue eyed, hottie with a body, can I say that in church? She's my bride, so of course I can. You know, I, I'm committed, devoted to my beautiful bride. And do you think it's okay for me, a committed man of God, committed to my wife, do you think it's okay for me to have a friend of the opposite gender who is not my bride? Do you think that's okay? Maybe this is the part we can, we can say, yeah. How many say it's okay for you to have a friend who's not your bride or your spouse, of the opposite. Do you think it's okay for you to have something like that? We've got one brave soul, two, two brave souls. Okay, we've got, I, I would say it's okay, like Kia, Kia's my friend. I'd say Kia's my friend, she's a female, right? She's not my bride. Masada, he's my friend. I think Angelica's my friend. I, I, I would say that, let me, let me take it a step further. I'm gonna take it a step further. This is rhetorical, so don't raise your hand, right? <laughs> Do you think it's okay for me, a committed married man to my beautiful bride, to have a relationship with a female who is not my bride, who I desire a relationship with emotionally, possibly physically, maybe I'm texting them, uh, maybe I'm DMing them privately, maybe I'm desiring emotional intimacy, maybe possibly physical intimacy. Do you think that that is okay? I think we can probably take a survey maybe safely. How many think that is okay? How many think absolutely not? Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're, all, we're all in unison there. Now here's a here's the silly example for us to really deal with the heart and the crux of our issue today. Do you think, here's the question we're going to deal with, do you think it is okay for a committed, devoted believer in Jesus Christ? Someone who says, I am, I'm, I'm committed, I, I prayed the prayer, I'm ready to go with Jesus, whatever, he came in and revolutionized everything about my heart. Do you think it's okay for that person, that believer, that solid, biblical, founded, Christian believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you think it's okay for them to be committed, devoted to Christ, and also be friends with the world? That's the question we're going to deal with today, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be good. It's going to be in your face. It's going to be the gospel on display today. So, James chapter 4, let's start reading this question, this idea in verse number 1. I do apologize. This TV has a demon in it, so we have not been able to get this one up and running today, but we're over here, all right? So verse number one says this, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Have you ever wondered that question? Have you ever been in the middle of a fight with your spouse? I have. And you get to the middle of it and you're like, how did we even get here? What? And like, did you start it? Did I start it? Did our kid, did I do something? Have you ever been there before? Like, what causes fights? What causes the quarrels? And look, this is such a powerful question for us to, to ponder here today. And James makes such a bold, bold claim. Look what he says. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Wow. Is it not that your passions are at war within you? What is James saying? What in the world is he talking about? Think about it like this. You and I, we have a desire inside. I have a desire inside of me. That desire is sinful. That desire is evil. That desire is wretched. That desire, your desire is evil and is wretched. And constantly, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I constantly, my heart is that I'm more and more like Jesus. Every single day, is that your heart, to be more and more like Jesus every single day? And yet here I am as a man, as a wretched, evil sinner of a man. 
and here I am dealing with things in my heart. I deal with things like pride. I deal with sin. I deal with things that tempt me. There's a desire in me, and I'm constantly dealing with it. I'm constantly tempted. You are constantly tempted, constantly dealing with that thing inside of you. You try to shut it down, and the more you shut it down, the more the enemy comes in, right? The more you shut it down, the more you ignore it. The more you try to pray, the more you try to ignore that thing, the more the enemy comes into your heart, comes into your life, and tempts you, and tempts you, and tempts you, and it gets greater, and it gets stronger, and it gets stronger, and it gets stronger. And what does James say? What causes the fights? What happens in that moment? What happens when that passion, what happens when that rage, what happens when that lust comes out in your life, and you try to shut it down, and you try to ignore what happens in your life? What James is saying is this is what happens. These radiators are, this is normal, right? This is a normal thing. Just look for rats around your teeth. <laughs> Here's what happens. You shut that down long enough, and what James is saying is this, the fights and the quarrels among you, that fighting and that quarrel with your spouse, with your kids, with other believers in the church, that is you lashing out because you are constantly trying to shut that desire down. And what happens when you shut it down so much? Eventually, it's got to come out. Eventually, it's got to come out on something. It's got to come out on the people, on the person that is closest to you, and you begin lashing out. Here's, here's what I always say. I always paint this, but this is the picture I always give people. I tend to be uh, a bit of a healthy guy. I, I you know, I, I'm an athlete. Uh, I'm a pastor. This is what I do for a living. But I'm also an athlete. I've been an athlete my whole life. And so, along with being an athlete, I tend to fuel my body with things that are going to help me train. So I train every single day. I take one day off. Today is my Sabbath day. I take one day off, but I fuel my body with things that are going to help me train and that are going to help me recover. There's four things. It's got to help me train. I've got to perform in the gym. And I've got to recover after the gym. And then I have to sleep. I have to have a healthy sleep habit, a pattern in my life. And then I have to be the best husband and the best father and the best pastor and the best friend that I possibly can be. That means this, that i got to go to the field and run around for hours on end with my kids. I've got to be able to fuel my body. Now, along with that, there I'm a normal dude. I've got kids. We go to McNeese right over here. This one right here. You can see the golden arches right over there. We go with the chicken nuggets. My kids don't eat them all, so what do I do? I eat them. A whole box of donuts, no problem. I can eat an entire box of donuts. Colin, the crap, and I, we have a thing going on here in a few short weeks. We're going to, we have a, uh, a competition. We, we're going to see who can eat the most Taco Bell tacos. The number right now is 40. 40 is on the table right now. I guarantee I can eat all 40 Taco Bell tacos. No problem whatsoever. Yeah. Double we'll bacon cheeseburger, you name it, I'm there. I can eat five. I'm not kidding you. And I'm not. Here's the thing. With being an athlete, those things are all wonderfully just not awesome. Right? They're, they're, they're not going to help me train. They're not going to help me recover. They're not going to help me sleep. They're not going to help me be the best version of myself. But here's what happens. I, if I shut down those cravings long enough, if I shut down that Boston cream donut long enough, if I, if I shut down that bacon cheeseburger long enough, here's what happens. My kids come to me and say, Daddy! And my response is, What? What do you want? Right? My spouse, my lovely bride, Hey, babe, what? What do you want? What happens is I start to lash out on people around me because I've got a craving deep inside of me. I've got a, I've got a craving that I have to, I've got to fill that craving in my life, and I start lashing out. And this is James' point here today. What causes the fights among people? What causes the quarreling that you're feeling between your life? Maybe with a spouse. Maybe it's a continual conflict in your marriage. Maybe it's a continual conflict with your kids, someone in your family, and dare I say someone in the church. What causes those fights among you? Is it not that your passions, that the things inside of you that the enemy tips you with every single day, is it not the fact that you were trying so hard and so desperately to be in love with Jesus and to shut those passions and to shut those desires down. But eventually you start lashing out because the devil keeps on coming and he keeps on coming. And his goal is to destroy you and his goal is to trip you up and his goal is to ultimately kill you. Is it not that your passions are at war within you? And here's my challenge for us today. That if in your life you are constantly dealing with perhaps conflict. If you're an individual who you finds yourself continually in the midst of conflict with people, with, with co-workers, bosses, kids, spouse, people, friends, if you're an individual who's constantly dealing with conflict, I, I challenge you to take a step back and say, perhaps the passions inside of me 
are getting to a point where I can't handle it anymore, and I'm starting to lash out, and I'm starting to act out, and I'm starting to rage against people, and I'm looking for the easiest target, and I'm looking for the people that are closest to me because I just need someone to bear my wrath. I need someone to do that. Take a step back and say, perhaps there's something, perhaps the enemy's coming in more and more and more every single day, trying to tempt me, trying to get me tripped up. Now let me just take it a step further, that as a believer, and as I look across this room, I would say that there's probably a, a lot of believers in this room. If you are the recipient of someone lashing out upon you, you find yourself as the recipient of that, I would challenge you. And if they are a believer, I would challenge you to take a step back and show extreme amounts of grace for that individual. And to come alongside them and ask them that question. How's your soul? How, how does your walk with Jesus? Are you okay? Are you doing okay? Not only am I going to pray, like, what's my natural response? If you lash out on me, I'm going to lash back at you. That's our natural human inclination. That's what we want to do. But as a believer, if someone's lashing out upon you, I challenge you, show grace. Come alongside them and say, how are you doing? Are you in the Word? Are you with Jesus? Are you making are, are you making it an effort to be with Jesus every single day? What causes these fights and quotes? Is it not that our passions are at war with it? This is going to be good. It's important like verse 1. Verses to go. We gotta, we gotta keep going here. Our first number, verse number two. James is just gonna prove this point now. He says this: You desire, so he's made this claim. You have fighting and you have quarreling, and it's all a result of the passion inside of you. Verse number two. Look at this. He proves the point. He says, You desire and you don't have, and so you murder. And you're like, that's extreme. I don't think that describes me, but okay. And then he goes on and he says, You covet, you covet, you want, you see. You want that new car. You want your co-worker's house. You want their promotion. You want that thing. You want it. You want it. You come it. You need it. You have to have it, but you can't obtain it. And what does James say? And so you fight. And so you quarrel. And you have conflict. And you lash out. And you rage. You want. You want. You want. But you can't have it. He says you fight. And you quarrel. And you're like, that's maybe a little closer to home. And then he says you do not have because you do not ask, oh my gosh, have I been here all the time? God, I need this. God, I have to have this in my life. But I fail to pray, and I fail to ask, and so I don't have. Verse 3, you ask, and you don't receive. Oh dear Lord, how many have been here before? You pray, God, I need you. God, heal my pride. God, do a work in my kids. God, I need provision financially. God, do a work. And you don't receive don't get and you don't want and you're frustrated and you're angry and you're mad at God and you lash up and what does James say? You don't, you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Ding, 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 ding. And James' point is this, from the most extreme examples of sin, from things like murder all the way down to the little things in your life like asking and not receiving. There's a constant waging of war going on inside of you. And it's so critically imperative that you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ understand that there is a waging of war for your soul. There is a waging of war constantly. And if you are not daily attuned to that battle going on in you and in, in internally in your life, you're going to be a casualty of the enemy. It's constant in our life. We have to be on guard. We have to be willing. And then verse 4, James goes on. And now he's going to kind of change his focus to kind of the, 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 the crux of our title today. He's going to go on and say, look what he says. He says, you adulterous people. Wow, that is strong. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Can you just, can you just pause for a moment and just think about that? Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Pastor, I, I've got friends who aren't believers. I, I, I mean, I, like, I, I go to places that aren't the church. Right? Like, I, I, I mean, I, I, I live in the world. I have a job. Right? Like, I, like what, what is this saying? Do you not know? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I just want us to let this sink in for a moment. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes herself an enemy of God. This is the call then of every single believer on this planet. 
to soberly take a step back and reflect upon the fact that I am either all in with Jesus or I am all out with Jesus. There is no in-between and there is no gray area. I want you to hear the truth of the gospel today that there are no gray areas when it comes to your relationship with Jesus Christ. You're all in or you are all out. And I feel as though the church has done an incredible disservice, especially the modern day church. In an effort to remain culturally relevant, we have dismissed the gray areas in our life. And we've said, those things are okay. You can just brush them under the rug and it's totally fine for you to go and do, for you to go and be, for you to go and desire, for you to go and enjoy the things that this world offers. And that's not what scripture says. That is not what, the, if the church that you go to says that, you need to get involved in another church because that's not what scripture says. Scripture says anyone who wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You're all in or you are all out. There's no in between and there's no gray. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says this, I'd rather you be burning hot. I'd rather you be on fire for me, experiencing all I have for you. Be hot or I'd rather you be freezing cold. Have nothing to do with me. But if you're in the middle, if you're right in the middle, God says this. That's the most vile, disgusting taste in my mouth. And he says this, Revelation 3, verse 16. I will spew you from my mouth. I will spit you out of my mouth. You stand in opposition to God. You say, Pastor, this is so harsh. This doesn't seem at all like the way I live my life. Listen, you're all in or you are all, you're fully devoted. You're fully committed. You want all Jesus has for you or you want nothing that Jesus has for you. What are the things the world offers? Look, I'm not here to give us an exhaustive list. You got a gambling addiction? No problem whatsoever. You can get online today. You can gamble your heart away. You have a desire for someone who is not your spouse? No problem at all. Complete anonymity. You can dial it up online and have your affair waiting at your front door. You have a lust-filled heart? That's easy. Click of a button and you have all the images and every video you can ever imagine on the palm of your hand. You want a life of fame? You want a life of fortune? You want a life of acclaim and accolades? No problem at all. Go start a YouTube channel and you can have all the acclaim. Be consistent and you can have all the acclaim and all the accolades. You want friendship with this world? In that moment, you make yourself an enemy of God. That's, that, that is strong. That is, that is the words of James to you today. If you desire, I love the way the NLT, I want to read from the NLT. Let's put it up there now. It says this. Which, uh, yeah, right there. You adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Look what he says. I'll say it again. That if your aim, if your aim is to enjoy this world, you cannot be a friend of God. If your aim, if your goal in life, if your goal in life is to enjoy this world, you cannot be friends with God. I, I, I want to challenge you today with this. Spiritual neutrality and spiritual apathy is adultery of your heart. Spiritual neutrality and spiritual apathy is adultery of your heart. You're either all in and you want all God has for you, or you want nothing to do with God. Listen, today, if you're one foot in the church and you're one foot in the world, let me just help and make it easy for you. You're not with God. You're an enemy of God. You stand in opposition to God. If you're one foot in the church and you're one foot just to appease your guilty conscience, you come to church on Easter. You come to church once a month. You come to church just to kind of quiet that voice in your head. You're not in with God. You're out with God. You stand in opposition to God. And God would say this to you. This is God and His grace. He says, go, enjoy the things of the world. I don't want you to be in the middle. I want you to be burning hot on fire for me. I want you to be freezing cold, have nothing to do. Go enjoy the world. Go live your life today. If you're one foot in and one foot out, I'll make it easy for you. You're not in. You're not in in this moment. But today, if you're one foot in and you're one foot out, and today there's a conviction in your heart and you say, this is my life. This, you're describing me to a T. Right now, there's grace for you. There's amazing grace for you. There's incredible mercy for you. And today, there's an amazing God waiting saying, I've got grace. And I've got grace. And I've got more grace for you. And I've got more mercy for you. I've got more for you. I've got more, more, for, more mercy for you. If you want for it and you want for that, you're not with God. But today, that describes you, there's a God standing with arms wide open, waiting to welcome you back into the family of God. Standing with mercy. Standing with grace. This brings me to uh, a question. Let me, let me give you a little insight. As a pastor, when I'm writing a sermon, 
writing a talk, there's always a section in my notes that's labeled optional. <laughs> and, I, and I never know if I'm going to preach it until I get to the moment of it. But I feel the Spirit is, is leading me here. Um, this brings up a question that I think many of you have asked me. I get asked, not frequently, but periodically as a pastor. Can an individual who is a Christian, can that person lose their salvation? Have you, ever, have you ever asked that question? Maybe another way to put it is, once I'm saved, am I always saved? And have you asked that? Has people asked you that question? I'm going to give you the answer. It's a, it's a hard answer. It's a straightforward answer. But before I do, let me give you a disclaimer. Uh, people will ask me as a pastor, um, again, this is a frequent question. Um, hey, pastor, do you think that I'm saved? And my response, I always, forgive me, uh, this is carnal and terrible, but I always laugh in my head because I'm like, I, I don't know. I cannot know your heart. Only God the Father knows your heart. So here's our disclaimer today. When you prayed that prayer, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I need you in my life. I want you in my life. Be the Lord of my life. I surrender to you. Amen. When you prayed that prayer, only God knows. Oh, hear me. Only God knows. If there was an eternal work done in your heart in that moment. Now hear my heart today. I can stand before you as a pastor, as a man of God, as a committed believer of Jesus Christ and tell you this. That the Spirit of God testifies with the Spirit inside of me that I'm a child of God. I know that at the end of my life I'm going to spend an eternity with my Savior and with my Maker. Because I long for that day when God looks at me and says, well done, David. My good and my, I know that my soul is secure in heaven, but only God knows. You can't know my heart. I can't know your heart. I can't know if when you prayed that prayer, there was an eternal work done of salvation. I can't know that. Only God can know that. All right, here's a high point. Let's say, for, we'll just use me as the example. Let's say, for an example, I prayed that prayer, and I prayed that prayer when I was a kid. All right, I, I've, been, I've been serving Jesus since I was a kid. I had some rebel years in my junior high and my high school, probably we, we all did, right? So I, I did my thing, but I came back to the Lord. Let's say, for an example, I prayed that prayer, and there was an eternal work done in my heart on that day. I prayed on a, on a couch with my mom. My mom led me to the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for my mom. Let's say there was an eternal work done in that, in that moment. 20 years later, 30 years later, I find myself desiring to what the Bible says, Enjoy. Let's go back to the other slide. Right? Okay. I find myself desiring to enjoy the things that this world offers. I find myself desiring things of this world, friendship with this world. The hard and the fast answer of the truth that you and I have to realize is this today. Can a person lose their salvation? Yes, you can. There is a moment in your life when you stop desiring the things of God, and you start desiring the things of this world. And in that moment, the Bible is clear. These are not my words. These are not what I'm writing. I, I don't write it, but I do preach it. That if your aim, if there was an eternal work done in your heart, only God knows, I don't know. I cannot know. But if there was an eternal work done in 20 years, 5 years, 30 years later, your aim is to enjoy the things of this world, you stand as an enemy of God. That's why the Bible says this, and I want you to hear my heart. That's why the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. Because at the end of your life, God is the only one who has the power to save you and the power to destroy you. That's why on this planet, we come before God and we say, God, I need you. I recognize my need for you. I cannot live this life on my own. I need you every day of my life. Redeem my mind. Redeem my eyes. Redeem my heart. Redeem everything about me, God, because I have to have you in my life. And you work out your salvation. You work out your salvation. It's not a one and done thing. You work it out. You work out your salvation with fear and with trembling before the God whose eyes burn with fire, before the God whose eyes are going to stay before one day. Yes, you can lose it. That's why you work. That's why you, your communion with God, your communication with God, you desire the things of God. You set your mind on things above. Anyone who desires, aim is to enjoy this world. You stand as an enemy of God. Verse number five. Or do you suppose that it's to no purpose the scripture says he yearns jealously over this? Look at this. He yearns jealously over the spirit he has made to dwell in you. God wants you. God loves you. 
God created you. God remembers the day He intricately formed you in your mother's womb. God knows you. God sees you today. He longs for you and relationship with you. Can I give you a terrible, silly example? Listen, at the beginning of 2021, I decided I was going to, at the tender age of 36, I was going to learn how to become an artist. And I got myself a sketch pad, and I got myself some color pencils, and some markers, and number two pencils with sharper. I got it all. I went and spent like 40 bucks. I could have gone to the dollar store and got it for five. But I went all in. I was all in for this whole thing. And I decided I was going to learn how to draw. So I did. This, I don't know what it is, but it's cool. I've got a penguin. That's amazing. I've got a squirrel. Let's go to the next one there, Matt. I've got, uh, I don't even know. I've got Baby Yoda. Baby, any Star Wars fans there? That's, this is me right here, right here. I think I have, do I have one more? There's Squirtle. Any Pokemon fan? Any Pokemon fan at all? Yeah, we've got a few Pokemon fans. Uh, these are all mine. I, I know the time. I know the energy that I spent. Like, these, took, these took me hours. Hours on I'm staring at an image on the internet and like tracing and erasing and doing the whole thing. Like I know the time and the energy that I put into these paintings. God knows, this is a terrible silly example for you to understand, that God knows the intricate detail that he put into making your spirit and making your soul. And he longs for you. He is jealous for you. He yearns for you jealously, the Bible says. He is so ready to spend time with you and spend relationship with you. It's not as though I were to give one of my, my incredible drawings here and I were to give it to you and you were to treat it like trash. And if we treat our souls like trash, God breaks the heart of God because God knows the value of your soul. He knows the value of what he's called you to do. He knows that he longs to be reunited with you, not only here on this earth, but the moment Jesus comes back or the moment you die, he longs to be reunited with your spirit and when he longs, he yearns jealously for you. Verse number six, James says this, but he offers more grace. But he offers more grace. And then you need more grace, and then he offers you more grace. But then again, you messed up and you need more grace, he offers you more grace. And today, if you stand with one foot in the church and one foot in the world, guess what? He offers you more grace. And if you stand, knowing what you did last night, as one who needs Jesus, guess what? He offers you more grace. And you messed up, and you stepped out, and you cheated, and you lied, and you sinned, and you name it, and he offers you more grace. And he offers you more grace. And he offers you more grace. But look at this. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud. For the person who thinks, and I want you to hear me clearly, for the person who thinks that you can live your life with one foot in with God, and one foot out with God. God says, I oppose you. I oppose you. God opposes the power. For the person who thinks that they can live that way, that is prideful to even think that you can live with one foot in with God and one foot out with God. God says, I want all of you or I want none of you. He offers more grace. And he opposes the power. And he gives grace to the humble. And he says, for the individual who says, God, I know I can't live my life on my own. God, I know I need all you have for me. He offers more grace. He offers more grace and more mercy. And today you're in need of more grace. He offers you more grace. And he said, I sent you my son. And I died for the value of your soul because I know what you're worth. And I know what I've called you to. He offers you more grace. But if you continue to stand in opposition with one foot in and one foot out, you stand as a prideful individual who God opposes. You stand as an enemy of God. All right, we're going to wrap it up here. We've got to fly through these last seven verses. James has done a great job of really creating this predicament for us, right? Like, okay, well, how do we do this, right? Because I do have friends that aren't in the church. I do go places that aren't the church. I do have a job, and I have to make money, and I have to have a savings account. I have to, like, I, I have to do things in this world. So James is going to really make it abundantly clear for us. Verse number seven, it says this. What is the solution? Verse number seven. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to the almighty creating God. Submit yourselves, therefore, God, here I am. God, all I am, all you have for me is all I want. God, if there's any wicked way in me, Father, I repent. God, I give it to you. 
you, God. I, I, I strip myself of all my fleshly desires. I give it all to you, and I lay it down at the foot of the cross, and I need you to do a work in my heart today and every minute of every single day and tomorrow and next month, and I need you to do a work in my heart. God, I submit all you have. All you are is all I want. I submit myself, therefore, to God. Number three, verse 7, resist the devil, and here's the promise, and he will flee from you. Do you feel tormented? Do you feel tempted by the devil constantly? Do you feel reminded constantly of your past? Do you feel reminded constantly to sin? Do you feel reminded constantly? Do you feel tempted constantly? Here's the promise. Resist the devil. Are you resisting the devil? There's a promise. He must. Another translation says he must flee from you. Number eight. Verse eight. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Are you with God? God is much with those who are much with him. God is much with those who are much with him. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse number nine, Matt, go on to the next slide. It says this. Be wretched. Oh my gosh. Be wretched and mourn and weep. What in the world is it saying? Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. That seems backwards. Be wretched and mourn. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. What is this saying? This is the heart of confession. This is the heart of repentance. This is the heart of saying, God, I have failed. God, I have sinned. And God, I'm coming before you. And I'm confessing my sin before you. And then I'm going to go to my spouse. And I'm going to confess my sins to my spouse. And then I'm going to go to the person I wronged. And I'm going to confess my sins to the person I wronged. And then I'm going to go to my pastor. And I'm going to confess my sins to my pastor. Because God, I want to humble myself before because I don't want there to be any blockade. I don't want there to be anything in my life that is blocking you from coming into my heart, that is blocking full relationship with you, full devotion to you. I want you to do all you can in my life. And look at this verse 10. Humble yourself before the Lord. Humble yourself before the Lord. What does that mean? Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. The moment you come in and you say, Jesus, God, I have sinned and I repent. This is what happens. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and he looks and he says, look, God, David is repenting. David is confessing his sins. David wants to be more like us. David wants more of us in his life. And in that moment, Jesus interceding for you says, God, God, look at David right now. And in that moment, Jesus exalts you before God our Father, and he gives you more grace, and he gives you more grace, and he gives you more mercy, and he gives you more grace, and he gives you more grace. Exalt you before God, our Father. Verse number 11, James wraps it up with this thought. He kind of goes back to the very first thought we had. We're talking about conflict with each other. James is going to kind of come back to that thought now. He says this Don't speak evil against one another, brothers. Why? Because you and I are all on the same level playing field. You are, and I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I am a sinner in need of the work that Jesus did on Calvary on that day. You are no better than I. I am no better than you. We're all in that same place. We're all in that same boat. We need Jesus to come into our heart and to do an eternal work of salvation in our lives and in our hearts. Don't speak evil against one another, brothers, because that person is dealing with a selfish desire. That person is dealing with a sinful nature, just like you're dealing with your sinful nature. Don't speak evil against one another in the church. Don't speak evil against your spouse. Don't speak evil against your kids because they're in need of Jesus just like you are in need of Jesus. Don't speak evil against that person on the street because they need Jesus just like you need Jesus. Don't speak evil against your coworker who you disagree with. Don't speak evil against your boss who you disagree with because they need Jesus just like you need Jesus. The one who speaks against the brother and judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law. Your judge. Verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and one judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are you to judge your neighbor? James' final thought is this. You can't be married to God and be a friend of the world at the same time. You can't be married to God and be dating the world at the exact same time. You're either all in or you are all out. And finally, Jesus says this. I already mentioned it. Revelation chapter 3. I'd rather you be hot or I'd rather you be cold. But if you're right in the middle, that will spew you from the mouth. And God said today, looks at me and says, hot or cold? You pick. 
we pray together today?